Hello, I am Flash Isaac, and today I will be solving Uniben Physics post UTME questions. Feel free to visit flashlearners.com for more videos, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel to get updates of my new amazing videos. Now let's look at these questions and even more. The first question says, which of the following is the best known semiconductor? In physics, a material can either be conductor, insulator, or semiconductor. Conductors are materials that allow the flow of current easily. They have lower resistance. Meanwhile, insulators, they don't allow the flow of current. Then semiconductors are in between conductors and insulator. So they allow current to pass unless when they are dope and their conductivity is not as high as that of the conductor. Now, the most popular or the common semiconductors are silicon and germanium. So the correct option here is D. Another semi uh, popular semiconductor is silicon. And the process of adding impurities to semiconductor is called doping. Semiconductors in their pure form are called intrinsic semiconductor. They don't allow the flow of current. When you add impurities to them, to the process called doping, they begin to conduct. And semiconductors, they have four electrons in the atomic shell. Sorry, holes. Ho, 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 and ho. So if you are doping, you can either add trivalent impurity or pentavalent impurity. If you are adding trivalent impurity, these are elements that have electrons. Three in their atabot share. In that case, one electron fees here, one fees here, and one fees here. You are left with one hole. This type of semiconductor is called P type. There are more holes than electrons. Now, when you are doping with pentavalent impurities, any element that has five electrons in the atabot share is called pentavalent element. In pentavalent element, one electron covers here, one covers here, one covers here, one covers here. Still left with one. One electron is remaining. So here we have more holes, more electron than holes. We call this N-type semiconductor. The third question says, the dimension of power is... So what is the dimension of power? In physics, we have uh, fundamental quantities and derived quantities. Fundamental quantities are independent of any other quantity. They are on their own. Example, we have a mass, length, and time. The dimension for mass is m, length is l, and time is t. So other quantities are formed from these fundamental quantities. They get their units and they get their definition from fundamental quantities. These are not the only fundamental quantities. We have a quanti uh, current amount of substance, and more. I'll share a link to that video. Power is equals work over time. It is the time rate of doing work. And work is force times distance. So we can therefore say that power is force times distance over time. Now, what is force? Force is simply mass times acceleration. Remember from the Newton's second law, we derived that force is equals ma. So from that, we have the power is equals ma s over t, where ma is force, s is distance, and t is time. Now, mass is fundamental, time is fundamental, distance is fundamental. So we have acceleration left. We need to convert acceleration to also fundamental form. What is acceleration? Acceleration is velocity over time. So we can come here and say M A S M V S over time times time. So this is the time that's already here. Acceleration is velocity over time. Bring it another time here. So to give us M V S over T square. But look at it. Velocity itself is a derived quantity. Velocity is displacement over time. Therefore, we need to convert this velocity to fundamental quantity as well. To give us m, displacement is 
velocity is distance over time or displacement over time. So we can put distance over time times t squared that's already here and this other distance. So we have this. It may look rough here, but understand the principle and put it in the way that you understand. Now that we have all these and they are also already in their fundamental form, we can simply bring this to replace them. The first we have here is M, which is mass. And the dimension for mass is M, capital letter M. So we come here and say M. This is distance, this is distance. They have to do with length. So their dimension is L. So we have L, L over time. Dimension for time is T. So we have T times T square. This will give you M is M is just 1. L times L is L square. So L raised to the power of 2. So we have is 2. Over T times T square would give you T raised to the power of 3. So that is the dimension for power. Or we can say M raised to the power of 1. L square t raised to the power of minus 3. If you bring t up, this gives you the dimension of power. So let's look at the correct option. The correct option here is option C. So m is raised to the power of 1, l is raised to the power of 2, and t is raised to the power of minus 3. Number 4 says, the number of atoms of a radioactive substance is initially 8 times 10 raised to the power 16. If the number reduces to 2 times 10 raised to the power 16 in 64 minutes, what is the half-life of the radioactive substance? So we are looking for half-life. Now, half-life is the time taken for half of a radioactive substance to decay. N over N naught is equals 0 0.5 T over... This is the formula for uh, half-life. Where this is the uh, new mass remaining, this is the initial mass, the total mass that was there before disintegration. This is the time it, take, it takes, and this is the half-life. If we have this, N0 is the initial mass of the substance, while N is the mass after decay. So N is 2 times 10 to the power of 16, while N0 is 8 times 10 to the power of 16. This is equals 0 0.5 times 64 minutes. So, and the answers are also in minutes. So we can work with minutes as a time. So this gives you 64 over t half, half life. 0 0.25 is equals 0 0.564 over half life. So looking for the log of both sides, we have log of 0 0.25 is equals 64 over half life log 0 0.5. So this will give you 64 over half life is equals log 0 0.25 over log 0 0.5. This will simply give you 64 over the half life will give you 2. This is 2. Therefore, half life is equals 64 over 2, which is equals 32 minutes. So the half-life is 32 minutes. Now look at this. It says an electric lamp has the following markings or rating. Uh, 230 volts, that's the voltage, and 250 watts, which is power. Now how long will it take the lamp to use 1 kilowatt hour when connected to a 230 volt means? Now, the 1 kilowatt hour is the work done. So work done is equals 1 kilowatt hour or 1000 watt. That is the work done. And recall that power is equals work done 
over time or time rate of doing work. If power is work over time, this simply means that time is equals work over power. And remember, we are asked to look for time. It will take the lamp to use one kilowatt hour, which is the work done. This will give you power is 250 watts and work done is 1000 watt hour. Converting kilowatts to watts, this simply becomes 1000 over 250. So this is watt hour and this is watt. So watt can simply cancel watt remaining hour, meaning we are not solving in time. So time is equals 1000 divided by 250 is 4. So the time it will run is simply 4 hours. And that's option C, 4 hours. The next question says, A gas occupies a volume of, that's V1 is equals 40 cm cube, at a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. So let's say T1 is equals 27 degrees Celsius. And a pressure of 880 centimeters of mercury. So that's P1 is equals 80 centimeter mercury. What does it occupy at? So here, P2 T2 is equals 87 degrees Celsius and pressure P2 is equals 120 centimeter mercury. So what does it occupy? This shows that we should look for V2 and for the option, you can see the, uh, they are in cm cube. So we are looking for V2. This is the question. Looking at this question, you notice something. There is unity. Everything, they are all in cm cube. So no need to convert to millimeter. Normally, we solve in millimeter mercury. But this is already in centimeter mercury, centimeter mercury, and volume is in centimeter. So we need not convert. That's number one. Number two, temperature is given. So we can convert temperature to Kelvin. It's given in Celsius. So to convert this to Kelvin, it simply equals 27 plus 273. So this becomes in Kelvin. Here, to convert to Kelvin is 87 plus 273. Now that you have this, this is a gas, general gas equation. P1, V1 over T1 is equals P2, V2 over T2. If you have this, we have P1, eight, uh, 80 centimeter mercury. We have volume, V1. 40 cm cube. We have the first temperature, which is 300 Kelvin. We have P2, this is 120 centimeter mercury. We have T2, which is 87 degree Celsius. That's 87 plus 273 Kelvin. What we don't have is V2. Therefore, let's make V2 subject formula. Making V2 subject formula, we simply have that V2 is equals P1, V1, T2 over P2, T1. So substituting these values, we simply will be left with 32 cm cube. So you can try that and get back to me. So that is the answer to that question. A radio wave has velocity of 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meter per seconds. Now, a radio station sends out broadcast on a frequency of 800 kilohertz. AF is equals 800 kilohertz. And velocity is equals 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meter per second. Now, what is this asking us? It's asking us to find the wavelength. Wavelength is lambda, is the question. And from waves, we know that 
v is equals f lambda lambda is simply velocity over frequency frequency is given in kilohertz so we can convert to hertz by multiplying by 1000 this becomes 800000 hertz therefore lambda is equals 3 times 10 to the power of 8 over there is 8 times 10 to the power of 5 so it's 8 times 10 to the power of 5 this will simply give you 375 meter so the wavelength is 375 meter this is how you solve questions like this so let's look at the next set of questions question 8 says a wave of frequency 10 hertz forms a stationary wave pattern in a medium where velocity is 20 meter per second the distance between adjacent nodes is the distance between adjacent nodes simply means a uh, distance from node to node and the distance from node to node is simply lambda over 2 and distance from node to antinode should be lambda over 4 so if this is lambda over 2 what is lambda from waves we know that v is equals f lambda and lambda which is wavelength is velocity over frequency now the velocity of the wave is 20 meter per second which is 20 and frequency is 10 hertz so 10 the wavelength is simply 20 divided by 10 that's 2 meter if this is true but we are not looking for lambda we are looking for distance from node to node and the distance from node to node is simply lambda over 2 which implies that node to node is lambda over 2 and is equals 2 over 2 and this is equals 1 meter a concave mirror has a focal length of 12 cm 12 cm that is the focal length f is equals 12 cm at what distance from the mirror should an object be placed to give an image exactly as the object so they are asking us that in this mirror what distance should it be placed so that the image distance should be equals object distance in other words what distance should it be placed so that u is equals v what ob uh, distance should that object be placed to give an image exactly as the object so if image distance is equals object distance and from the mirror formula we have that one over focal length is equals one over u plus one over v now one over f is equals if u is equals v it means that we have one over u plus one over u which is equals 1 over f is the LCM is u 1 plus 1 is 2 so we have 2 over u which will give you u is equals 2 f u is equals 2 times so-called length that's 2 times 12 cm this will give you 24 cm so that will be the distance. The next question says, what is the dimension of Young Modulus? Young Modulus is simply a tensile stress over tensile strain. And tensile stress is simply force over area. While tensile strain is extension over length. This is the same thing as force over area divided by extension over length which is force times length over area times extension and what is force force is mass times acceleration times length over area is length times length which is l square and what is extension extension is change in length which is also length so the dimension is l mass is m that's the dimension acceleration is velocity over time so this means we have v over l cube 
time is here times l velocity also is displacement over time velocity is uh, displacement over time so we have a um, displacement over time and uh, another l is already here l cube is here and t is already here so this we are left with m l square over l cube t square so this cancels this we are left with m over l t square which is m l t minus one so m one c minus l minus one and t minus two so that is the dimension for young modulus let's look at the last question The last question says, a working electric motor takes a current of, takes, that's the input, input. So the input current is 1.5 ampere. When the PD across it is 250 volts, so which means the input voltage, V input, is equals 250 volts. If its efficiency is 80%, Efficiency is 80%. Find the power input. Find the power output. So power output is the question. Power uh, uh, efficiency is equals power output over power input. We are given the efficiency we are giving the we are asked to look for the power output but we already have current input and voltage input and remember that p is equals iv therefore power input is equals current input times voltage input and we already have them to be 1.5 and 250 this will simply give us 375 what so we have the power input and we have the efficiency substituting we have that a t is equals power output over three seven five times hundred power output will simply be eighty times three seven five over hundred this should simply give you 300 watts. So that is the power output. So that is it on Uniband Physics post TME questions. Uh, feel free to check out my next video for the part two. This is the part one. And I advise you go over it again for better understanding. And if you have any question or complaint, simply use the comment box. And feel free to subscribe to this channel for more amazing video. Thank you.